Is that Gary? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was in a video game, so. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of Thai. My name is Naresh Soni, and I'm the president elect for Thai for next year. I wanted to do a very brief introduction about Thai. Uh, what does Thai stand for? Thai stands for fostering entrepreneurship globally. We have presence in 17 countries and we have 60 chapters. We have more than 3,000 members and several charter members all across the globe. Thai was founded in Silicon Valley. It's a nonprofit organization and has 21 industry sectors. Members of Thai are leading entrepreneurs, executives, venture capitalists, and if you look at Thai, Thai is brand is globally synonymous to entrepreneurship. This was said in Economist magazine, and also Kaufman Institute uh, made a statement regarding Thai's entrepreneurship. The wealth created by Thai is in hundreds of billions of dollars. Several entrepreneurs, several companies have come out. And we have very highly distinguished charter members. Uh, quite a few of them are here present. And these charter members are, you know, they are like mentors. They are giving back to the community. So we are really thankful for these charter members. Also, I would like to thank our sponsor, and today I'm honored to say that Gary Rayner, who is one of the serial entrepreneurs in the community, is here. Gary, where are you? I'm Sophia. And uh, Gary is on his uh, another startup now. Uh, he's uh, telling me he's in stealth mode. But uh, we'll see, uh, we'll hear more about Gary's uh, startup pretty soon. Uh, we also are uh, thankful to other sponsors. Qualcomm is another sponsor. The one, one unique uh, thing about uh, Thai I wanted to mention is our program, which is called the uh, Program for Young Entrepreneurs, TYE. And TYE fosters entrepreneurship at very young age. So we have a program that will be starting in October. I think Preeti will uh, give out flyers. And, okay, they're all on the desk, okay. And uh, this, uh, this program is meant for high schoolers. And uh, this is being run by Ralph Fuller, who, uh, who was uh, managing entrepreneurship and innovation programs at Reedy School of Business. And this program will be conducted at Reedy School of Business. So if you have children, or if, you, if your friends have children in high school, please, uh, I think uh, this is a very good program. Uh, it, it, it's a boot camp of eight weeks, and we'll have uh, the best uh, members uh, you know, teaching entrepreneurship, and there will be competition, and they will be judged on their business plan and all that, but I think this is a great program, and I think everyone, all the kids should apply for this program. The other thing that I wanted to mention is today, we are honored to have Sapi join us. And Sapi is South Asian Physicians of Indian origin. We have the president-elect, uh, one of the renowned surgeons, who is a great friend of mine, Harish Kusalkar. Harish? And Sergeant, who is also a great uh, eye surgeon, who is with us. And uh, I think uh, you know we are forming a great alliance with Sapi 
and the medical community is joining uh, us as uh, uh, in, in a collaborative way. We'll have a panel of MDs pretty soon. With that, I would like to give to Anil. Anil, who is a charter member and was also a senior executive at Qualcomm, will do the introduction of our chief guest today. Thank you, Naresh. I'm glad to see so many of you join us for this uh, most significant keynote. Uh, we have had a good uh, record of uh, inviting and getting and then enjoying uh, keynotes from people as distinguished as our speaker today. Uh, those of you who've come here for the first time, uh, I hope you'll come back and not just for the food. <laughs> our talk today, uh, the keynote, uh, John uh, is going to speak, uh, Dr. John Madison is going to speak about uh, big data and wireless technologies and how they will help to restore wisdom in healthcare. Uh, I can't wait to hear uh, that. I think uh, his own description of uh, when we first uh, met uh, uh, about uh, three or four months ago and I invited him to come speak, uh, he talked uh, about the exponential growth of knowledge across every sector of science and economy. Uh, this is in our uh, description of the talk, but I'm going to sort of reiterate uh, what John had shared, that we have so much uh, knowledge uh, across every sector, uh, and we have convergence. How can this be used, all this data that we're collecting, how can this be used to prove uh, the health of uh, all, you know, have healthier people in communities? Uh, the technologies that we have at hand uh, can support, and in his words, a behavioral symphony of wellness uh, and address the social determinants of health. So this is the kind of if I may venture to say, holistic approach that we want to hear about, see how that, that can come about. Uh, we, a lot of us are get, helping gather all the data from sensors and from uh, infrastructure that we have uh, helped to put in. <coughs> how can that be used to help uh, the social determinants of health? Um, and how do we reconstruct that framework for overall health? And uh, in this particular case, uh, John is going to uh, talk about the approaches that uh, that are uh, being considered um, at Kaiser Permanente and elsewhere. Uh, a few words on his background. Uh, Dr. John Madison is Chief Medical Information Officer and at Kaiser Permanente and Assistant Medical Director in uh, the Southern California region. Um, he began his medical career right here at UC San Diego and Scripps Clinic. Uh, where he practiced, uh, he was uh, responsible for emergency services, primary care, critical care, preventive medicine, <coughs> hyperbaric medicine, trauma, and helicopter medicine. So uh, he, he has been here and served in many different capacities. He joined Kaiser Permanente in 1989 and directed the largest deployment of Health Connect. Uh, this was Kaiser Permanente's health IT, revolutionary health IT program that supports over 3 million lives and is used by over 5,000 physicians in, in many hospitals and clinics. Um, he's been actively involved in international health data standards, and he founded the XML work uh, that led to the clinical document architecture and continuity of care document. Uh, he's actively involved in state and federal policy and governance of the health information exchange, and he's testified before uh, those in in government, various federal agencies on health, IT policy issues related to privacy and security, important issues to all of us. He uh, continues to drive towards better health and wellness and has expertise in big data analytics, uh, nature, natural language processing, mobile consumer applications, and the use of these tools in genomics to drive truly personalized medicine. So truly a very wide background that I'm sure um, will be, uh, uh, he will be commenting on. And uh, uh, 
He has been an active member of both the AMA and AMIA task forces in the future of health IT. Uh, he is also a senior advisor to the $10 million Tricorder Prize, X Prize. So if you've heard of the X Prize, there is the Tricorder Prize sponsored by Qualcomm. Uh, it's called the $10 million Tricorder Prize, and he is a senior advisor to, to that. So with that, please welcome Dr. John Max. Thank you for the uh, very kind uh, introduction. Um, I always like to have some sort of prop uh, for my talk, but I, I left my uh, uh, portable EKG device that I uh, used on a woman on a flight back from Boston last week and was able to uh, help her prevent missing her trip. But uh, in two minutes, um, Ramesh Rao has arranged for a, a particular prop that I think you all might be interested in. So Ramesh, if you want to come on up, we've got about two minutes remaining. Um, he timed this around this talk. Interference Sari Gatidia Abad Rup se Jari hai. Is Samai Akaitation Samat Lochuka hai, or hum Kaval Antina ke Gumane ki Pradicha Kabahe hai, or Wobi Acho Magic Hoga, Kyoki Yebi command computer may loaded hai. Kaval hum eight minute tetali second ki duri par is Mahatapur chance. Minute 43 seconds to the confirmation at Earth's Har time of the confirmation. Har dharkan, behat tej, aur bhoat mahatapun ho jata hai ki hum har aankron ko bhoat bariki se adhyan karein. Sabhi nigahen keval un drashyo ko dekhti hui jahaan pe hume mehsus hota hai ki hum in apekshit aankron ki or bada rahe hain. Lagbag एक मिनट की दूरी और जब एंटीना भूकंप की तरफ घुमा दिया जाएगा। लगभग आधे घंटे प्रज्वलन के बीत चुके हैं। तरल इंजन ने अपेक्षित रूप से निष्पादन दिया और ये बहुत महत्वपूर्ण होता है कि हम अब आंकलों को प्राप्त के बाद उनका अध्ययन करें और तब ये महसूस हो कितनी सफलता हासिल की है केवल लगभग 30 सेकंड और जब एंटीना पृथ्वी की ओर घुमा दिया जाएगा ये अनुमान समय है सो इट टेक्स 20 एंड हाफ मिनट बिफोर वी स्टार्ट वी हैड रिकॉर्डेड एन एक्सेलरोमीटर डेल्टा वी ऑफ 177.4 मीटर्स पर सेकंड द टारगेट डेल्टा वेलोसिटी टू बी अचीव इज 1098.7 मीटर्स पर सेकंड एंड वी आर नाउ the other period with the antenna It is now orbiting Mars. That was a live broadcast from India. That was the new Indian Prime Minister who gave his first interview ever to Fareed uh, Zakaria on Sunday, this last Sunday. So if you haven't seen it, watch it online. Uh, great interview, great man. Great future for India. But uh, I have to say, I've never quite orchestrated a better prop than that. For <laughs> <laughs> so, but it does fit with a theme of uh, exponentiality. So, um, as Anil indicated, um, I am. What I'm going to talk about is 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 kind of cruel to do after dinner because everybody's feeling kind of relaxed and comfortable in their chairs and. Uh, I'm going to uh, very quickly uh, try and approach the uh, capture speed of the rocket uh, that's now orbiting Mars and cover a lot of territory very quickly. So I, I got down to the shortest title I could think of, and that is Restoring the Human Touch in the Sci-Fi Generation Using Big Data, Little Data, Panoramics, which is all of the omics, and Wireless Technologies to Help to, to Restore Wisdom in Healthcare. Okay, 
So, there we go. So, uh, first thing I'm going to do is explain what I mean by the sci-fi generation. So, I think it was an at and uh, somebody correct me if it wasn't, but a, about a year ago there was an ad airing uh, about a 15-year-old uh, with his hands on his hips talking to his, his younger generation, 13-year-old brother and his friend saying, well, back in the day, when I had to wait minutes to download my videos, you guys don't even know how good you've got it. He was talking to his younger brother, a couple of years younger. Um, and so we're seeing a compression of transformational time. And so this exponentiality that was really well reflected in that ad campaign um, is why I, I call the generation of today, and the generations are generally named in their teens, a sci-fi generation, because there's nothing they can imagine that isn't going to happen in their lifetimes. There's literally nothing that they can imagine that isn't going to be possible in your lifetimes. And what we're all doing with big data and little data and all of the omics and the wireless technologies is actually going to give a whole slew of disruptive opportunities to uh, really transform what, what, what we call healthcare today, uh, but which is really about disease management um, and not about healthcare. And so um, it's my firm belief that we have the opportunity of our lifetimes to not just reform the payment system and reform the organization of healthcare, but really begin restoring health and prevention and wellness. And we have amongst us Vince Valetti, who has led some of the greatest work in preventive medicine in the country. Um, Eric Kaiser, president in San Diego. First, let me just uh, do a quick audience survey. So how many of you ever want a pedometer, Fitbit, anything like that? Ever, ever, ever? Okay, how many have one on tonight? Okay, QED, I'm gonna come back to why that is. Uh, how many, well you've all heard of the quarter X price because Anil mentioned it, but how many heard of it before tonight? Okay, um, we're down to 10, we start off with over 300 candidates, uh, we're down to 10 now, we just announced this about a month ago, and we're going to announce the first, second, third prize winners um, uh, next, uh, next year, um, and split the 10 million amongst the three. Uh, how many have used Uber, the cab service? How about Lyft? Or Lyft, okay. <laughs> Those, those who prefer Lyft. By the way, after you do your 40 hours in Lyft, you get 100% of the bill, whereas with Uber, they keep taking a cut. So that's why some drivers prefer Lyft over Uber. Um, how many have stayed in an Airbnb? Oh, cool, okay. If you haven't tried it, you should try it. Very cool. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that. How many of you have developed applications? Okay, maybe 20%. How many of you have developed wearable sensors or worked with wearable sensors? A couple, three, four, five, six. Uh, how many um, are working with omics or omic analytics? I know Ahmed uh, just told me he's working on that now. Um, how many have read the book Connected by Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler? Anybody? Okay, must, it's a must read. James Fowler's on the faculty, you see us now, they were at Harvard when they wrote this book. But they, um, they really showed the profound influence of our social networks on our health. Um, and it was done before the era of MySpace and Facebook and LinkedIn and things like this. Um, and so as soon as, and, and, and I found about uh, this book uh, where any good scientist would search, um, watching Stephen Colbert. Um, and Stephen Colbert was interviewing James Fowler and I didn't realize what a great sense of humor uh, James Fowler had, but he was holding his own with, uh, with Stephen Colbert. So I called him up a couple weeks later and I said, I really want to do some work with you. So we're, we're doing some work right now at Kaiser Permanente with James Fowler on uh, identifying uh, biomarkers of disease and then broadcasting um, out to the social networks um, healthy messaging that are related to those biomarkers. But I said, well, what are you going to do next? You, you know, this book is amazing. You're on Stephen Colbert. What are you going to do next? And this is four years ago. And he said, I'm going to look at the genomes of social networks. Has anybody read, and he just published it with PLOS One, um, last month, has anybody heard of the results of the study? <clears throat> the average person on your social network, and by the way, this hasn't changed since Aboriginal tribal days. The average tribe was about 200. On Facebook, the average person has, even if they have a thousand friends, they really only have about 200 that they maintain actively. And it's really, really tight friends, generally five or less. But if you look at the 200 real friends on Facebook of an individual, and he did get the IRB approval and got the consent and did their DNA sequencing with 1.2 million markers. And he found that on average, on average, not maximum, but on average, everyone in your social network is related to you as closely as if you shared a great, great grandfather. This, this is really profound. And a lot of it relates to smell. There was another study uh, published last week um, that you can actually 
predict whether someone's a Republican or a Democrat based on how their sense of smell. Now, I'm not going to go any further than that. I didn't say how they smell, but their sense of smell. Okay. Um, and so the, the, he's doing some amazing work. Has anybody read Drive by Daniel Pink? Okay. What Daniel Pink did is he reviewed the literature on, on um, really sort of motivational theory. It was done by experimental psychologists in the 50s, 50s, and 70s. Old stuff, it's brilliant research. And actually show what really motivated people. And if you haven't read it, I strongly encourage it because all of these digital data, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the Fitbit now, almost everybody here has worn an accelerometer. There's only three or four people that have one on tonight. Why is that? Nobody wants a digital man. Um, what we want is we want to be more mindful in our lives. And so my advice to people wearing accelerometers is to use them for three purposes to initiate, to motivate, to calibrate their behavior to create more mindfulness so that you actually extend the period over which you check to see how you're doing. So instead of, oh, I'm 100 steps short this morning, or I'm 500 steps short of goal today, you start reaching out as you begin better at meeting, meeting your goals to how did I do this week, and then not looking for a month. And then, instead of checking at the end of the morning how many steps short am I of my goal, you, you see the elevator and you say, where's the stairway? So you begin to internalize and begin to become more mindful. To those of you of Indian descent, this may sound very familiar to a lot of the ancient wisdoms around mindfulness and meditation. And a lot of what we need to do with digital technologies is use them to help support and restore some of those uh, mindful technologies. So a couple of other quick books. Um, Persuasive Technologies, B.J. Fogg at Stanford has literally written a textbook on how to use technology to persuade people. Um, there's a social networking site called Patients Like Me. Has anybody heard of that or used it? Okay. Um, using, using social networks to help support patients with each other. <clears throat> Another great book, if you haven't read it, The Second Machine Age, too. Uh, MIT profs um, published it earlier this year, and they talked about how robotics and AI are going to replace 50% of the jobs currently in the world. And the uh, CEO of Blackstone, who manages uh, $3 trillion in capital, um, 240 countries talked to the Prime Minister of every country and asked them what their top concern was, and to a person, every one of them said, it's the looming structural unemployment associated with AI and robotics. So um, after China, if you haven't been in China recently, I would go soon because the way it looks now is nothing like it was 10 years ago, and the way it's going to look in 10 years is nothing like what it looks like today. Um, they took all the people out of the field, they brought them into the city, built these huge, you've probably seen 60 minutes, empty cities, um, but they also built things like Foxconn that makes all of our smartphones and smart pads. Well, um, uh, Google, among other things, has acquired eight robotics companies and they have a contract with Foxconn and they're now telling these people, you know what, we've got these robots and their health insurance is a lot cheaper than yours um, and you go back to farm, farmland now. And that's happening across the world. And so there's a series of books like Abundance uh, by Peter Diamandis, the CEO of the XPRIZE and Byron Reese, Infinite Progress, with a utopian view of how all this technology is going to rise the tide for all boats. And there are others writing very dystopian scenarios of how all this massive unemployment is going to hit us so suddenly it's going to cause massive social disruption. Social disparities are already beginning to increase. We're all aware of the disappearance of the middle class. Um, Richard Florida's book, Reset, talks all about that. Um, and so that's really nothing new, except the difference is that whereas dystopia has predicted the same outcome with the agrarian revolution and with the machine age, the first machine age, and with the industrial revolution and the urban revolution, it never happened because so many new jobs are created. And so the question is, is this current revolution in technology going to be moving so quickly that the creation of new jobs will not keep pace, and that there will be, at least for a sustained period of time, a structural significant unemployment. And that's a real concern, and that's what the second machine age talks about. I encourage, encourage all of you working in the tech space to be very mindful of the fact that creating more social disparities may be a through technology may be profitable in the short term, but may not be something that we will look back on fondly uh, in the long term. And we need to be very, very mindful of those social disparities. George Packer has written extensively about this. Um, final question here is. Um, how many of you have read the book Goodnight Moon to Children? Okay, good. So now you recognize the chaotic format of my slides. <laughs> okay, this is a slide I show at every talk only to pay homage to the physician 
uh, founder of Kaiser Permanente, Cindy Garfield. Um, he published this in 1970, so uh, 44 years ago. And this was his vision of integrated <coughs> care delivery based upon integrated systems. And we just completed doing this about five years ago. So for the first time since he published his vision 44 years ago, have we been able to go past his vision? So now to sort of the heart of what I want to talk about, and that is, so Ray Kurzweil's popularized the notion of the singularity, and he's found a singularity university where uh, I'm privileged to uh, teach every year in the medical section. Um, and um, he, he and Peter Diamandis, his co-founder, have renamed uh, singularity university in all of their courses to exponential economics, exponential medicine, exponential business, exponential um, you name it. So all of their courses are being renamed as exponential because that is what's happening in every single platform and every single ecosystem. So I decided, um, which I'm about to do, to create a new word called ecosystem, um, which refers to the multi-platform ecosystem that is that is helping, that is really sort of the transitional phase into the singularity that Ray Kurzweil talks about. So you look at the internet, the cloud, connectivity everywhere, smartphone, video dial tone, we all have FaceTime, we can do FaceTime with anybody anywhere on the planet. We just watched live, thank you Ramesh, um, the capture of a rocket or, or in Mars from uh, India with the Prime Minister of India, that was real time streaming. Um, and we're doing that now in healthcare. We, we used to have tele-dermatology, tele-psychiatry, tele-cardiology. And so uh, I argued aggressively, we need to stop thinking about tele-X, we need to think about pervasive, we need to think about video dial tone and pervasive um, video, which is what we're, we're doing now, and let the, the ideas and the uses pro proliferate. So um, it's a platform um, with video on the smartphone, smart tablet. The social element. Um, so there's a talk back east last week on the social internet of things, all of the data from the so-called social exhaust. Um, the quantified self, most of you heard about this, you know, this is where the term small data comes from. I'm a research subject, uh, one of the first research subjects uh, with Mike Snyder, the chair of genetics at Stanford. So every three months uh, while I'm up in the Bay Area, um, I have 6,000 blood assays and four complete microbiome sequence, just on a routine basis. Uh, watching um, for trends and um, outliers in those trends and then correlating them with my uh, health experience along with all the other subjects in the study. Um, and so this is an increasingly growing population, mostly in Silicon Valley, frankly. Probably 80% of the quantified self people live in the Silicon Valley, but it, it is beginning to spread. Um, the exposed zone, San Diego County has the highest density of sensors anywhere in the world. Uh, we have more mobile and fixed sensors looking at environmental uh, contaminants and pollutants. Uh, and there's a whole team at UCSD working on this out of the Qualcomm Institute. Um, and Kevin Patrick is working that work, uh, doing some uh, collaborative work with him, looking at flares of uh, lung disease in our patients associated with the sensor data to see uh, when, where, and how uh, different contaminants cause flares of lung disease. Um, the thousand dollar genome, everybody knows that Illumina, located a couple miles from here, announced this just a couple months ago, that they had hit the point of a thousand dollars for a full genome sequence. Um, if you plot, which Peter Diamandis has done, uh, and others, the cost of the genome sequencing beginning with Craig Venter's two billion dollar genome, um, it is super Moore's Law. It, the cost is declining faster and faster and faster, but it's already way past Moore's Law in terms of its decline. So in three to four years, it'll be a couple hundred dollars. It'll be considered malpractice to treat somebody without their full uh, sequence um, in their, uh, accessible to you. Uh, people can opt out, and they will, but it will be injudicious of an individual not to take advantage of that information, particularly as some of the folks in this room develop the analytics around what the real meaning is. And right now, there's not a whole lot to get out of 23 me. It's interesting. How many have done 23 me? just out of curiosity? Okay. It's interesting, it's fun. Uh, it doesn't change a lot of lives. That's because there are more per permutations of the human genome than there are people who have ever walked the face of the earth. There are more viable permutations of the human genome. So the complexity of the genome, the transcriptome, the up and down regulation of genes, the resulting proteome and the post-translational changes of the proteome, the lipidome, the metabolome, uh, the reactome, the immunome, all of the downstream effects are so intimately related to environmental influences and exposome that the complexity of all this requires massive high-performance computing. So the cost of the genome is declining at super Moore's law, but the, but the 
uh, power and cost of computing is still kind of stuck in Moore's law. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to think of it being stuck in Moore's law. But compared to a lot of these other exponentials, it's moving slowly. And so in the next couple of years, we will be able to make sense by combining these data. And I just want to digress a second into a conversation I had with my daughter less than a year ago. She said, Dad, you know, I'm studying biology, and they want us to learn about meiosis. We all remember studying meiosis, right? And it was kind of complicated when I studied it. So like any good father, I said, oh, I know how to explain that. Let's go to YouTube. Um, so I turned to YouTube and showed her what meiosis was. And for the first time in my life, really appreciated what meiosis is all about. So think about it. This is after hundreds of millions of years of evolution. What um, trial and error or divine intervention, depending upon your beliefs, um, created is in a matter of seconds and minutes, you consider each gene an idea. So it's 30,000 genes that code for proteins, hundreds of thousands of other genes, we don't know what they do yet. Um, and the, the, the paternal and the maternal chromatid uh, align with each other, and they have kinetic cores that connect, and they just start randomly swapping ideas back and forth on every single chromosome across the two chromatids. It's the ultimate idea mashup that's never been paralleled by anything created by humans. And then moments later, you randomly take the maternal chromosome 1, the paternal chromosome 2, and, and so on, and you do your second massive mashup. And then you go from, with the first stage of meiosis, you go from diploid to quadruploid to haploid. You can create four sperm out of, or four eggs out of each one. And then whenever the moment arises, um, and there's lots of ads for drugs that can help with this, um, you um, have the fertilization of the egg of the sperm. So you have three complete, deliberate, incredibly random mashups of different ideas that are represented in meiosis. It's the most mind-blowing, creative process generating diversity that has ever existed or ever will exist. And yet, we, we all studied it in high school biology and didn't really, I didn't really appreciate the significance of that. So electronic health data, exponential growth and phenomic data, predictive analytics, machine learning, AI visualization, my prediction is that we will be generating 10 times more knowledge, true knowledge, not data, but 10 times more knowledge from research in silico versus traditional forms of scientific inquiry by the year 2020 with the amount of data that we have in the growing body of analytics and visualization. That's a that's pretty radical change, and, and I think we're well on the way. Uh, persuasive technologies, how to motivate people, which is really important to creating the behavioral sensitive wellness. And then avatars, AI, robotics, head up, heads up displays, 3D printing. They just got the first 3D printer, printer on the space station this week um, to basically uh, replace any part that breaks in the outer space. You just make a new one on your 3D printer. You can buy them in Costco today. There's two different versions of 3D printers you can buy in Costco today. Um, and then um, something that I'm really interested in is how avatars and digital assistants are going to start broking our relationships with the universe. So the amount of information that we're going to know about us through little data the amount of information that's exploding across all of these platforms in the Pleco system is so vast that it's already well beyond the capacity of the human brain to manage it. So we're all going to, we already have sort of minim, minimalistic digital assistants. Amazon knows who we are and what we like. Google knows who we are and what we like. Uh, the NSA, oh, <laughs> um, but that's, um, that's the kind of thing where uh, digital assistants and avatars are going to play a huge role. So I gave a talk about five years ago um, at UCSD in an unconference. Um, I had 10 minutes uh, between when I was invited to talk and when I um, uh, decided what to talk about. And, I, and so I said, you know, who is your avatar and why do you care? And so these avatars that already exist are free. They just come when you, whenever you buy something or use the web. You're being tracked. Um, but pretty soon we're going to demand that we have all this information about us concentrated about us so that we can use it more effectively and it's valuable to us. So we're willing participants to have our data co-opted for the most part. But a recent Pew Memorial uh, Trust research showed that people don't care so much who has their data. They don't. What they really care about is what are they doing with my data. And that's why who owns our avatar really matters. And what are their objectives and what are their values? And how do we align their objectives and values of the creators of the avatars with our own so that we can begin to broker our own experience of our little data, everything about us, with a universe of knowledge? And 
Uh, if that sounds far out, I know of a couple dozen startups that are working on this. So there, there was a startup about six years ago called Intellitar. I don't know where they've gone since. But basically, if you wanted to impress your great, great, great grandchildren that you were an expert in baseball, you could just infuse your Intellitar with everything that was ever known about baseball, and then your great, great, great grandchild could ask you your, your surviving avatar question, and you would know the answer to everything in baseball. Mm -hmm. So um, this is, these are not new ideas, um, as um, the author of Neuromancer said the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So what are the implications um, for a moment about the panoramics for the health sciences and health education? So with all of these omics, an explosive growth in every single one, um, and the emergence of startups like Emerald, anybody heard of Emerald Phar Pharmaceuticals, the Bay Area, it's a new startup? They basically do research a la carte. They do biotech, biomed research a la carte. You tell them what you want to do, they have all the certified reagents, all the certified, um, every minuscule detail document what they do, and you can basically, like, a la carte, order research, and they will do it for you in an incredibly controlled environment. It's a whole new model of doing research, and I think a lot of the folks in the Mesa here are going to start paying attention to what Emerald's doing. Um, there's, there's groups like Berg Pharma, I toured their lab in Boston uh, a year and a half ago, and they're doing research in mass with all the omics, so they uh, subject uh, a cell culture to a new drug, and they measure 25,000 ish cellular polypeptides in a matter of minutes, uh, along with the lipidomics and transcriptomics and so forth. So, th this stuff is, is being commercialized. And super exponential growth and demand uh, for high performance computing. So, what does this all mean? I mean, how do you make sense of all the omics, and what's, what's the end game look like? So, genomics is pretty stable. So, the only case where it's not really stable is that um, every woman in this room has had a child actually has cell clones from their children in their body. We know this, um, that, that you're inhabited by clones of each of your children. Um, so that, that's one exception. The other exception is cancer, of course, is the disease of genomics. And there's a lot of polyclonality um, in uh, cancer. But in general, what's relevant is once-in-a-lifetime genome. What that will tell us is who's at risk for what. So someone over here may need to get a PSA to screen for prostate cancer um, every month, uh, starting at the age of 30, and someone on the other side of the room, their genome will tell us that they never should have a PSA, and better yet, we'll actually have much better markers of early detection of prostate cancer than, than a PSA. And we'll get rid of this whole controversy about should you or shouldn't you have a PSA. Same thing for mammograms, same thing for pap smear, same thing for colonoscopy. Um, DNA testing for um, the emergence of early colon cancer in the stool is available today at the start. And, and this is just happening everywhere. I'm uh, going to be speaking at a conference with Scientific American and uh, NPR in Boston on Saturday and Sunday uh, this next weekend about uh, some of the work that's being done on point of care testing using PCR, um, which um, can tell us whether someone's infected with uh, which which uh, strain of the flu, an H1N2 or an H2N5, or God forbid, an H7N9, the Asian flu that has a 40% mortality. That same company that has that capability today, we're going to be testing that here so that we don't have everybody come in with a flu into our clinics and cough all over each other and share their viruses, but detect them and which antibiotics are susceptible to, which antiviral drugs are susceptible to before they even get into a waiting room. Um, this is a project that we're um, working on right now. And um, the founder of the company that's doing that was asked by the CDC to um, use her um, point of care testing for the current Ebola outbreak in Africa, which as you all know is um, pretty frightening. Um, but to be able to diagnose um, in a matter of minutes um, someone very reliably with uh, high sensitivity, high specificity um, is already available. So, Genomics is going to individually uh, identify risk. Point of care PCR sequencing will help triage infectious diseases. Um, the pharmacogenomics, and there's, a, there's actually some really good products in the market today already that look at the pharma, pharmacogenomics and help you not only select the proper drug based upon your metabolism patterns, based upon your cytochromes and your metabolism, um, but, but how to dose it, because some people really do need very, very low doses of a drug that other people really need very high doses of it. We just don't know how to do that in medicine today. Um, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics will drive 
the selection of which drug within class is the best for each individual, highest benefit, lowest risk. Um, and proteomics and metabolomics will help us monitor the benefit, but you know, long before we see the clinical benefit, we'll be seeing the proxies in the uh, small molecules. And then transcriptomics and, and uh, stem cell therapies will begin to actually cure um, various genetic diseases. So I did warn you I was going to talk fast. I apologize, but I'm trying to um, cover a number of things quickly. So the implications, uh, further implications for health science. Has anybody heard of lamins? Anybody know what lamins are? So lamins are the protein, the structural protein that contain the nucleus of every cell. And we've known for over a decade the structure of these inert proteins that manage the nucleus. But what we've discovered in the last couple of years, and a lot of the work's been done here at UCSD, is that different mutations in lamins lead to different diseases in different organ systems. And so the whole structure of medical education, the whole structure of medical textbooks based upon a, uh, an autopsy view of the human body, and that is an organ system based view. And yet we know that the genetic etiology is going to transcend organs Oh, the, the amount of evidence that this is true is overwhelming. It's just not being taught in our medical schools. It's just not being practiced because we don't yet have the therapeutic interventions to match it, but we will very soon. Um, so I ran into, I gave a talk at the Wolfram Conference um, two weeks ago in New York, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, I really want to do what you're doing. I really want to, I'm really interested in this stuff. And the reason is, is that my whole life I've had this profound fatigue and I knew there was something wrong, and the doctors all told me I was crazy. And this guy's about 30. And he said, so I sequenced myself, and I found out that there's only two um, genes known to affect folate metabolism, and there's uh, various variants of those genes, and I have the two worst variants of each of those diseases, and I'm chronically severely folate deficient. So I've been taking mega doses of folate, and I've never felt like I do now in my life. So this. 30-something just walked up to me and, and told me his personal story about how his sequencing had changed his life. Um, and so we're going to be seeing uh, more of that. And those of you know who, those of you who know Larry Smart, who heads up at Cal IT2, sponsored by Paul Common Institute, um, uh, is one of the pioneers in the microbiome. So the microbiome, um, I'm just going to skip ahead uh, to a couple of slides here and then come back to the microbiome. So some of the implications for the pharma industry and the FDA are really, really profound because in a couple of years, um, and it's hard to know how long it takes, and there's, there's a saying that futurists uh, frequently mistake a clear view for a short distance, and I suffer from that disease. Um, so I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but there is going to be a day soon when physicians will have information based upon a $200 complete genome of an individual that says that this person should not have the, the drug indicated by our clinical practice guideline for everybody, but should have a different drug class or a different drug within that class based upon their genome, and it's not, it's not going to be approved by the FDA. So they're going to use it off-label, and if anything goes wrong, they're going to get sued, and the justification will be you used a drug off-label, not, not approved by the FDA. So I've had discussions with several of the folks at the FDA, and, and I have some more lined up to say, that none of their regulatory processes are capable of scaling to the exponential growth of knowledge in, across all the elements. It's just, they're, they're not scalable. And they need to transform from a regulatory organization into a certification organization <coughs> where they basically certify people for worldwide crowdsourcing of the information because physicians are not going to sit back and not treat a person that they know would benefit by drug B when the only drug approved for that their disease is drug A, because it just hasn't been through the multi-year regulatory process. So um, a lot needs to change in the pharma industry. So some of the implications for pharmaceutical companies are that um, what used to be a blockbuster drug for cholesterol or a blockbuster drug for hypertension or diabetes is now going to be micro-segmented. And with that micro-segmentation, um, is not only going to be which population works best for, but which populations it may not be so good for. And so the, the, um, the serious problem we've had forever on publication bias, that is, they fund 20 studies, one of them turns out shows benefit, the other 19 don't. Okay, that's the student two-tailed uh, t-test. Uh, one out of every 20 studies has a spurious false positive result. They throw out the 19, they don't publish them, that's publication bias. 
So when you start looking at the amount of information that the drug companies are going to have about <coughs> who shouldn't get their drugs, the risk of publication bias is huge. The second implication is that there's going to, this research is going to become more and more expensive because of the volume of uh, sample size needed to be able to generate these micro cohorts that are, that, that are valid over time. And that's going to force the pharmaceutical companies to be more collaborative. Okay, they're going to have to be more collaborative because otherwise they're all going to be researching all the same stuff on everybody. It doesn't make sense. And they'd be doing it on different populations. So they're going to have to pool their data. They're going to have to collaborate. And then there's going to be a shift from the FDA being the regulatory agency to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission being the regulatory agency. Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the FTC is going to be, become more of the regulatory agency than the FDA because this collaboration that's required is uh, potentially a risk for more publication bias um, if they're, we're not watching them very carefully. So, um, uh, Samuel, has anybody read The Half-Life of Facts by Samuel Arvison? Great book, a little bit dense, but it talks about what we hold to be true and what we learn in our various graduate programs is disproven faster and faster and faster with this exponential growth of knowledge. So we read the book called The Half-Life. Facts. John Ioannidis is a professor at Stanford um, who has shown that nearly half of all published medical science is subsequently disproven. Okay? And that's only the stuff that's formally disproven. That's not the stuff that people know is wrong and they don't even bother to disprove. So um, the FTC really is going to, in my view, become much more profoundly influential in drug development than the FDA. Again, I have a pretty clear view. I have no idea how long it's going to take. But to me, it's pretty clear that that's an extra. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the micro-segmentation of populations, not by genomics, but simply by social determinants of health. So it may not be obvious, but this is the San Francisco Bay. Here's Silicon Valley here, and here's the East Bay, and, and back in Walnut Creek and so forth. And these are this is the prevalence of obesity in our members um, of Kaiser Permanente. That's people we have data for. Um, and you might say, well, we know which communities to go after, but then you look at asthma, and it's not the same. And then you look at depression, and it's not the same. And so we can do these heat maps and look for various diseases in communities. There's a lot of overlap, obviously, but we need to start thinking about community health. We need to think about personalized medicine, we need to think about community health, and we need to think about some of the social determinants of health in addition to this personalized revo um, medicine revolution that we're undergoing. So a little bit about the emergence of little data and the quantified self movement. So if you don't know Larry Smart, um, he's done some amazing stuff. Mike Snyder at Stanford. Um, Mount Sinai, Eric Schott's done some work and has, has uh, subclassified diabetes. And it's not just type one and type two, there's actually seven genetic classes that are very distinct that are emerging out of their big data work. Um, Jessica Richman, who grew up here in San Diego, um, it started UBiome, um, True Citizen Science, where you mail in um, a stool specimen, uh, just a very small stool specimen, by the way, <laughs> and it can be dried, and it should be dried, and you, you only fund the research required to sequence your microbiome um, using ribosomal DNA, which is very conservative, and so she's generating this massive amount of information uh, at a population level um, of what's going on in the microbiome and associated with the diseases. So, um, and Linda Adie, one of the co-founders of 23 Me, started a group called Curiosity, which is all about the little data about all of us. So I'm gonna skip the rest of that, just go to a picture of Larry. So this is Larry Smarts. How many people have seen the wall at UCSD? If you haven't, it's pretty cool. Um, so um, he has a whole team of visualization experts. But each one of these represents the microbiome of an individual, and on average we have a uh, that we know of 2,000 species of bacteria at any point in time across uh, the biome of bacteria. And when you take an antibiotic, you make the mass extinctions from the asteroids in the Yucatan Peninsula and the supervolcanoes in Indonesia, you make them look like trivial events. So when you take an antibiotic, you take a very stable set of 2,000 bacteria in your gut and you just totally wipe it out and transform it. And you end up often with either antibiotic-associated colitis or uh, worst of all, uh, clostridium uh, and difficile uh, colitis, which can be fatal. And now the most effective treatment, so the medical literature showing the most effective treatment for C. diff, uh, many of you know people who have had C. diff infections from antibiotics, is what are called poop pills. 
And what poop pills are is purified, healthy gut microbiomes to restore a normal microbes. So there's lots of research going on therapeutically for many of the almost 100 diseases now that have a specific fingerprint of the microbiome. Each one of these microbars here is, a, is another species um, in the microbiome. And so you can begin, begin to recognize a disease state by the uh, phylogeny of the uh, species of bacteria in your gut. So there's 10 times as many bacteria in your gut as there are cells in your body. There's 100 times as many genes in your uh, microbiome as there are genes in the human genome. So the, the fascinating thing is we think about our immune system as sort of responding to infectious agents and allergens and pollens and stuff. But most of the training of our immune system comes through what's passing through our gut. And about 15% of the circulating microRNA in our bodies is, comes from our diet and processing from our bacteria in our gut. So the, the, these things, the point is, these things are all incredibly interconnected. And every one of them, the knowledge is growing at an exponential rate. And to really begin to understand why, you know, decades after the discovery of the human genome, we still don't fully understand, we hardly, barely understand what's going on with it, is because of the profound variation generated by meiosis and because of the profound interact interactivity of all of the panoramas, the environment, the microbiome, how that conditions our immune system, how the immune system conditions our neurobiome and our connectome. And it, it is going to require a fair bit of high-performance computing to get us where we need to go. So, um, Anil mentioned that I like to think of the Behavioral Symphony for Wellness and link it to some of these modern technologies. So, um, how do we begin to, after we identify that you're at risk of something, and after we begin to have useful <laughs> analytics to know when someone at risk <laughs> is going the wrong direction, and we know how to motivate you and how to persuade you using persuasive technologies, all like BJ Fogg, and we know that there are community variations, and we know what kind of contaminants are in the environment, how do we begin to take a community-based approach and create a behavioral symphony for wellness? Because we are the end products of all the behavioral cues um, that, that impact us on a daily basis. So that's why I mentioned uh, Danny Pink's book, Drive, which really talks about some of the motivational aspects. But um, the epidemiologists and the preventive medicine folks will tell you that the single most influential factor for the health of the community, by far, there's, there's not even a second close determinant is average income. And so you might throw up your hand and say, oh, well, so we're gonna fix that, right? It's a little bit difficult to go around fixing the average income of communities, but that's just a proxy for all kinds of other things that don't require a whole new um, employment base and a whole new economic base that can and should be addressed. So one of the things I've done is I've worked with the Public Health Informatics Institute and um, basically suggested that they create a benchmark like what the National Council on Quality Assurance has done for healthcare with uh, the HEDIS standards, the standards that hospitals and clinics are rated against each other to see how well they perform, but rate communities based upon the social determinants of health. What percent of the, of the residential area is blighted, so Detroit wins there. Um, what's the median distance from a home to a given social service? What's the median distance from a home to healthy food. If you ask kids in the inner city of New York what a chicken looks like, all they can identify by picture is a McNugget, seriously. Um, they've never seen cooked chicken. And there's what's referred to as uh, nutritional deserts in all of our inner cities. And so you begin to measure these things, and if we start benchmarking communities, then we can start applying the same kind of evidence and the evidence-based approach to clinical care, but to the community care and the social determinants of health so that we can explain and address what are the key gaps in this community? What is the capacity of this community to address those gaps? What is the appetite of this community, leaders in the community, to address these gaps? What are the tools that are relevant to those gaps? Which foundations and social agencies and governmental agencies are good at that? What sequence of addressing those gaps is relevant? Do you take on teenage pregnancy first, or do you take on crack cocaine use first? And begin to develop instead of an, oh my God, we're never gonna be able to fix this problem in the inner city, a rational, evidence-based approach to what is important, what is relevant, what is within the appetite and the capacity community, who, which foundation can come and help, 
and uh, how do we begin to make these changes? So um, I want to sort of crystallize it down into four big opportunities to restore wisdom into the healthcare system. And so the first is the behavioral sympathy of wellness. Uh, so our epidemics of obesity and diabetes and the lifestyle disorders really just reflect a collision of our old genetic stingy genes with an abundance of food and all the marketing and all the super processing of food so that we no longer do what people in all the blue zones around the world which live long healthy lives um, have known for centuries to um, eat healthy local food, exercise daily, get regular sleep. Regular sleep has a profound influence on health and we now know that regular sleep has uh, the, the proteins that contribute to neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques in the brain that are very highly associated with Alzheimer's disease. The clearance of those proteins from our brains occurs predominantly while we're sleeping. If we do not get good sleep, we are accumulating neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques much faster. Lots of recent evidence um, that demonstrates that uh, one of the many functions of sleep is to clean up the garbage, take the garbage out. Um, and so, but all of these uh, disorders of lifestyle really emanate from really basic wisdoms of eating well, sleeping well, exercising regularly, and the thing that's often left off is maintaining healthy social relationships, and that's where James Fowler and his work and the work of others is really very compelling about how important it is for us to pay attention. If, you're, if you've got a toxic boss, get a new job. If you've got toxic coworkers, move to a different department. If you're in a toxic relationship, get out. If you can help people who are toxic and salvageable, help them. And as Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel Prize winner, has once said, if you're feeling helpless, help somebody. So if we start thinking more in terms of the health of the people around us and who we choose to surround ourselves with and how we choose to help those around us in need, we can begin to change the up and down regulation of our genes. So methylation of DNA um, has been shown. If you take, so this, is, this seems a long leap away from social determinants of health, but it's really not. If you take mice and you socially isolate some of them and the others you uh, put into a very healthy social situation and caress them and pet them and so forth, but just is completely isolate the others, the rate of methylation of the socially healthy mice is vastly higher than the rate of methylation in the isolated mice. And that is known to be associated with uh, much better upregulation of healthy genes and downregulation of unhealthy genes. Um, so the country Bhutan has actually, several decades ago, replaced the gross national product with gross national happiness. And so every policy decision they make is not around the economics of, of, of their uh, commercial business, but it's around how do we make sure that there's a higher state of happiness um, in, in, in um, the community. And there's an entirely new ecosystem called evidence-based, what I like to call evidence-based compassion action. Um, I'll kind of try and get to that quickly. So the first opportunity is embrace the whole person with the behavioral sympathy of wellness, the whole person, the whole community. Um, and there's a lot of transitions we need to make so that we begin to address the mind, the body, and the soul, not just your DNA, not just the disease you present with, but what are the opportunities uh, for improving your health through mindfulness, and the mind, body, and soul. And all the decisions you make about your health, of them, 99.95% of your life is spent outside of the clinic and the hospital, and that's where we need to make healthier decisions. Second opportunity, community-centric health and wellness with compassionate reallocation. So how many of you have heard of cognitive reallocation? How many of you heard of the MIT red balloon experiment? Anybody heard of that? Ramesh, I know you have a couple people. So MIT, uh, this is just a class, there's another uh, protein folded. Did anybody heard of the protein folded project? Okay, so where they crowdsourced a really difficult problem and took people with computers and intelligence all around the world to solve the problem. So MIT um, took 10 red balloons and anchored them in 10 locations across the U.S. and said, okay, anybody out there, form a team with anybody you want. And the first team to identify the GPS coordinates of all 10 balloons will win a prize. And it, uh, it's like 40 hours for mesh, I don't, I don't remember the exact time, but it, it didn't take very long for a team to identify 10 balloons dispersed all across the country and get the exact GPS coordinates. So if we think of cognitive access, and you look at the work of Daniel Pink and Drive, where of the motivations, um, he calls them motivation 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. Motivation 1.0 is Maslow hierarchy, food, shelter, air, water, sex. 
two dot O is carrots and sticks, salary. Um, three dot O is what most of us are most motivated by, almost all of us, and that is making the world a better place. And so if you look at how many of us are frustrated um, in either working for a big bureaucracy or in the complexity of the, the, the business that we're in, how difficult it is to really feel that you're making a difference in the world, um, we need to bring that to a more local and sustainable model where we can actually begin to restore some of what used to be much more accessible to us when we lived in smaller communities and we knew our neighbors and we cared about our neighbors and took care of our neighbors. Um, and so there's a lot of work being done in this, um, in this space. So how many of you uh, have signed up for Nextdoor? Anybody? Nextdoor.com? Two, two folks? I highly recommend it. You're, you get everybody in your neighborhood to sign up for it, and you begin paying attention to things in your community. It's just a community social network. Very cool. Um, Lily Cole, who's an Oxford graduate, started a project called Impossible.com, and so she's doing that on a global scale with a global website, um, matching people with needs with those who are interested in doing random acts of kindness um, on Impossible.com. And then the actress Miranda uh, July, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but um, she um, was the first person to be nominated for both a, uh, a Tony and an Emmy before the age of 25, and she started something called Somebody. And has anybody downloaded Somebody? Okay, Somebody is really cool, because when you sign up for it and you turn it on, you have to submit a picture. When someone, instead of texting some, a friend of yours in Texas, you send the message out on somebody, and it finds somebody through GPS who's near the person you know in Texas who's at a conference, and gives the two the picture of the other, and the person who you send it to, a random person you've never met and who's never met your friend, walks up to your friend and says, hi, I am your friend, and I am telling and deliver, uh, personal delivery of the message. So sort of like the, the Valentine's Day flower delivery. <laughs> kind of whacked, but really interesting. <laughs> okay. Opportunity number three is applying evidence-based discipline and positive deviance. So everybody's heard of Live Aid and raising money for Africa and the Gates Foundation and you know on and the, the Clinton Global Initiative and all these foundations. Then Bisa Moyo, who grew up in Africa, wrote a book called Dead Aid. And what what she describes is how all these foundations each have their own hammer, and no matter where they go in Africa, they see the same nail and they just keep hitting it with a hammer. And what she has shown is that a lot of these foundations do more harm than good. And that we, uh, and, and so she's basically saying, why don't you actually talk to the people and see what they need before you bring your hammer and hit your nail? Uh, maybe they have a nail that they think needs to be hit. And so what we really need to do is develop much more of a rigorous, scientific, evidence-based methodology for identifying what a community needs, whether it's in Africa or South Central LA or East Berlin or the slums of New York, and identify using evidence-based tools and survey tools, what, what are the needs, what are the gaps, what are the opportunities, what are the organizations, and how do we monitor um, and, and execute on the evidence basis. The last opportunity. So, Edward Snowden and Angela Merkel. Um, privacy versus reciprocal transparency. Uber and Airbnb. So how many know what their, a lot of hands went up, how many people know what their Uber score is? Anybody? What's your score? 4.7. 4.7, that's pretty good. So this guy's never thrown up in the back of a cab drunk, <laughs> or it would be a lot lower. Okay, it's on a scale of one to five. You get to rate the driver, and they get to rate you. And if you get a rating of 4.5 or below as a cab driver in Uber, you're fired. If you get a score of 4.5 or below as a passenger, yeah, you might wait quite a while. I was telling this somebody in a cab just in New York uh, a couple weeks ago. I said, oh my god, I can never get Uber to pick me up. And I was like, oh, well, thanks. I don't think I'll accept your LinkedIn. <laughs> so um, I think the problem, you know, the cat's out of the bag. You know, so we've got Angela Merkel's phone conversations. Well, she has Barack Obama's phone conversations. And Putin has everybody. You know, we're not going to stop. The dissemination and the capture of data. It's not, you know, it's impractical. We, we, can, we can minimize it, we can demoralize it, we can revile it, we can legislate against it, but it's going to keep happening because the monetization is too great to overcome. And so, my belief that is we need to look more like Uber and Airbnb. Airbnb, by the way, you rate 
the person who rents you the, house, the place and they rate you. Um, same system. And so it's reciprocal transparency. David Brin, professor um, of philosophy here at UCSD, wrote a book in 1998 called Transparent Society. I highly recommend reading it. He was a real visionary about this very issue and, and talked about reciprocal transparency. And so we need to have watchers who watch the watchers across all these spaces. We are not going to be able to stop bad people from getting data. But what we need to do is have a mechanism to take our data fingerprints and say, show me who's got them and tell me what they're doing with them. Um, and um, I don't think that we're going to solve the problem by just um, outlawing the capture of data. One of the things that concerns me is that while I've subjected all of my um, genome and microbiomes, four microbiomes every three months, um, to Stanford research and to be freely shared with other research projects. Um, I don't recommend that for everybody um, because you are protected by GINA, the legislation for uh, privacy and genomics, uh, from discrimination in health insurance. You are not protected for life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care. Why is that? The reason is that the regulators and the legislators knew that if they went after all four of those, they'd get killed and they wouldn't get anything through. So they just went after health insurance. It's a smart move. But I've been talking to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and anybody in Washington who will listen about circling back and picking off the other three because you still can be discriminated against. Um, and it is very, very impossible. I wrote a chapter in a book about uh, secondary use in genomics. And if you de-identify your genome, you basically obliterated its value because it is ultimately the most identifiable information on the planet. Um, and that um, raises the opportunity for pooling data. So um, I mentioned um, to someone earlier that um, I'm co-chairing um, a work group for the Global Alliance on Genomics and Health um, to create uh, interoperability across all the genomics consortiums around the world. So there's you know, a dozen here on the Mesa. Um, there's a couple dozen more in the US. There are many dozen more across the world. And so uh, David Altshuler, who I met at the uh, Jason's work that we did together a year and a half ago, um, founded this organization out of the Broad Institute at Harvard for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And the whole purpose is to create the mechanisms for sharing and pooling data, uh, not necessarily in the same physical space, but through federated models, um, so that we can actually begin to capture larger sample sizes to really begin to understand and disambiguate the complexity of all these omics and all their interactions. And the problem is, as I said at the beginning, there are more viable permutations of human genomes than there are people who have ever walked the face of the earth, let alone alive today. And so it's very, very difficult um, to do that with small sample sizes. So we need to be able to ask the question, what are the uh, SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with schizophrenia across a large population? Well, guess what? That data was published two months ago. Three genetics consortiums pooled their data and they tripled in one study. They tripled the number of SNPs that are now known to be associated with schizophrenia. That's a profound leap forward in one of the most <coughs> debilitating diseases on the face of the earth, um, and with a very, very strong genetic component. And so this kind of ability to pool these data and work together, which is what the Global Alliance um, is intended to do and will do, um, is going to vastly accelerate this hyper-exponential rate of knowledge acquisition and uh, potential interventions. So I'm going to skip this slide a bit and just sort of refer to the fact that these data are coming from everywhere. Um, Safeway knows more about you than you can imagine. Google, and Amazon, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, and who was it, the, uh, the dating service? OkCupid. Okay, um, did, did, does anybody remember what they were outed for? Actually, they, they, they just very, yeah, the CEO just in an interview said, yeah, what, what we did is we, um, we, we wanted to see um, what would happen if we sort of budged a little bit on people's profiles in a positive or negative way and see what happened to the incidence of, of hookups. Um, so they were literally manipulating real people's data that paid money to OkCupid okay to run an experiment to see what would happen if they changed the profiles of the individuals. And he just casually mentioned this in the interview. So, um, yeah, go ahead. It was the power of suggestion. Yeah, the power, exactly. He was studying, the, it, was, it was a legitimate scientific study. He just forgot to ask permission. <laughs> <laughs> Minor slip up. You know, I don't know which IRB he hired, but I don't think they're a business. Okay. 
So a couple of other quick things about the five dimensions of the management of personal data. Um, this is my construct. Please criticize it if you see it differently. The first dimension is the classic. That's not mine. Time series, text, and graphics. The second dimension is the filters. So looking for outliers. An outlier is a value. An outlier is a trend. An outlier is an aggregation of data. And the aggregation of data, there's a company called Jointly.io, which was started based on a conversation I had at Singular University with its CEO. Um, where they, they've already shown that an aggregator data can actually diagnose things earlier than any individual parameter load. Aggregate trends and then natural language processing. So those are, so people are worried about, what are we gonna do with all this flood of information? Doctors already have too much, they're dying on the vine, and you're telling me, John, that we're gonna get all these sensors here, out of your mind, you're nuts, I don't want it in my chart. Um, well, patients do. And we need to have the filters, and as I mentioned, uh, I, I don't know whether that was a non-disclosure discussion, so I won't say any more, but one of the people in this room is working on this. Um, and uh, in addition to joining the .io. Third dimension is personal circadian nomograms. So my, my wife and my daughter, when they're 98.6, they're really febrile. I mean, they go to the emergency room and say, I've got a fever. They say, no, you don't. You're 98.6. Mm -hmm. Well, their normal temp is 97. And for them, 98.6 is a really, really high fever, and they're really sick. This is true across all, no, all parameters to greater or lesser extents. So in the world of small data, we are going to have a circadian rhythm nomogram for you that's different than your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your husband, your, your children. And we are going to be able to treat your personal nomogram. This is all well within the realm of capabilities we have today. Um, the fourth dimension is escalation. So machine to machine and machine to consumer. The consumer can be the individual person who's got the wearable sensors, it could be their healthcare provider team. But um, we need to have intelligent escalation because there's no human brain big enough to consume the, the data streams. And then the fifth dimension is what I call the accordion model of learning. So we need to sort of have the best filters and the best decision support we can at any point in time. But as there's new technologies, new evidence, and new knowledge, we need to open the accordion up again and rethink what we've been prescribing and then after we see what the two or three best things are, close the accordion back down. And every set of data is gonna have its own asynchronous accordion action of opening and closing and opening and closing. So if you just imagine across all of these platforms, we're gonna have opening and closing accordions of learning of, of sort of prescribing what makes the most sense with today's data, and then three months or three years later, opening it up wide open and saying, we gotta rethink everything and close it back down. Coming back to the half-life of facts, and John Yanidis proved that 50% of all medical science is disproven. So, um, those are the five dimensions. I'm almost done. Um, the topology of the sensor avalanche. I'm just going to summarize this slide by saying um, I did this for a, a group of sensor developers at a conference in uh, Minneapolis. Um, that we need to be thoughtful about where we locate the data, where we locate the analytics. So, the new aphorism in big data analytics is don't bring all the data to the analytics, bring the analytics to the data. To so begin processing things locally so that you can begin to overcome some of the unnecessary complexity. But that also highlights the need for an accordion model learning because if you localize the analytics too much, you miss the interaction between different data types. But that's a big challenge. And then I'm going to skip that. This is sort of a list of what we need device manufacturers to do in the future um, with self healing, temporal sensitivity, and so forth. Um, what is the role of pervasive sensing then? So most of you have worn a Fitbit, but tonight almost none of you have a Fitbit on. So what does that mean? Um, what, what, what is the purpose of a digital nanny? Well, um, I think it's pretty clear that every single junior varsity high school football player is going to have six accelerometers on their helmet within a couple of years, or their coach will get fired um, because of, of what we know about uh, traumatic brain injury and chronic concussions. Um, so the super athlete and the warriors already are special ops guys. We need to know if they're down because they're hiding in a hole and they're healthy and safe, or they're down and they're dead, or they're down and they're salvageable and we need to risk five guys' lives to go hollow out. So there's already incredible pervasive sensing going on special ops. So that's category one, or tier one. Second tier is acute illness, wireless inpatient monitoring is getting really extraordinarily um, integrated, uh, better, faster, cheaper and wireless. The third is chronic illness. We just charge someone from the hospital and monitor them and prevent readmission and help manage their uh, medications. And the fourth and most importantly, and this is where we can restore some wisdom to the healthcare system, is instead of using digital managed, restore mind wellness through mindfulness. 
So accelerometers, galvanic skin responses, glucose levels, cortisol. So Google just bought the contact lens, continuous monitoring of glucose. Hold on to your seats. Um, these kind of monitor and, and the, the X Prize, um, some of the novel modes of non-invasive sensing. You know, the, the tricorder is, you know, from Star Trek where they scan your body and tell you what you've got. Um, I, I um, wish I could tell you a lot more of what I've seen under non-disclosure, but I can't. It is mind-blowing what we're going to be able to do. And has anybody heard of Theranos um, Therapeutics? Okay, cool. So one of the rock stars, Silicon Valley. Um, I just had my cholesterol measured at, at uh, the uh, TedMed conference for $1.99. Okay, prick the finger, $1.99, get the result in the mail. Um, but that's invasive, they have to prick my finger. Um, these kind of technologies are going to be non-invasive and they're going to be cheap and they're going to be direct to consumer. Um, and all the laboratory regulation and all that stuff, just like the FDA is going to have to change, American College of Pathologists, the CLIA rules are going to have to change, and um, the founder of Theranos is all over that. So we need to be able to use the digital technologies and the non-invasive technologies like the tricorder work um, to do three things, to initiate healthier behavior, to sustain and motivate that healthier behavior, and then to calibrate it, because we've all had periods in our lives where things were going well and we were with the program and exercising and eating well and then we got divorced or then we lost our father or then we had lost our job or we, our startup um, failed and we go through stressful periods and we don't take care of ourselves. So these technologies and these non-invasive sensors are going to help us, particularly in the periods of stress, when we most need to pay attention to mindfulness and being thoughtful about what we eat, how we sleep, how we exercise, and even more importantly, how we maintain the health of our social relationships. So um, how is this digital world going to shape the future of human evolution? So um, I found a few really useful scientific representations. So the first one is homometricus. So this is the athlete warrior that's just finely tuned with all of the sensors um, and special ops or a high performance athlete. Um, and the second one um, resembles me about five years ago and many of us still, and it's homo gigas. <laughs> and um, all the back issues associated with the unnatural position of sitting. So I'm trying to, I didn't start off this talk that way, but I, I'm starting to get the habit of asking people who want to stand to please stand because no matter how much you exercise, you do not overcome the damage you've done sitting for the last hour of listening to me ramble on. Um, and so um, sitting is a really, really unhealthy posture, independently of how much you exercise rest day. And then thank you to um, another San Diego resident. We have what I call homo fast food arrest. Um, and that is, I, I did not create this slide, but that is indeed a McDonald's bag. So someday, um, McDonald's is going to come after me for showing this too many times. <laughs> and then in the evolution of high tech, something went terribly wrong. So here's what happened with flat panel displays. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, finally, what I see as restoring the ancient, using modern technology to restore ancient wisdoms and bringing wisdom back to the healthcare system is what I call mindful man. And those of you of Indian descent, this is not new news. But to the Western world, this is really new news. And Deepak Chopra right now is teamed up with Eric Schott, uh, who's doing some of the best big data analytics across all the panorama and the metabolome um, at Mount Sinai in New York to actually show in excruciating detail what happens to the human body and human physiology with, with um, a mindful, meditative life. And um, they haven't started publishing yet, but when they do, it's gonna, it's gonna really rock the scientific world. We already have plenty of evidence that's good for hypertension and diabetes and heart disease, plenty of evidence, but they're gonna show in excruciating detail how it happens. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is pick that in the interest of time. Um, Sir William Osler, one of the most famous physicians ever said, the secret to patient care is caring for the patient. How simple is that? I've added a few permutations. So the secret to health is caring for the whole person, not the patient. The secret to wellness is caring for our friends and family with digital augmentation, social gaming, and other 
The secret to resilience is caring for each other within and across all of our communities. And the social and community determinants of health are at the foundation of all this. And these foundations are doing some brilliant work. Um, and actually, San Diego is now going to be one of the first federally funded uh, projects to, uh, I just asked last week to be on the board of group that's going to use um, some of the underprivileged areas of San Diego as models for how to do what I've been talking about is taking on, in a scientific evidence-based way, the community determinants of health. And San Diego is going to be the first to, I think they're going to fund like 500 of them. Uh, but we'll be the first to go live with that. Um, so how is this going to change the new position? So um, it's quite honestly very disappointing. And Lydia Gritman is sitting back here, fellow physician we train together. Um, it's kind of discouraging to see what's coming out of medical schools these days. And it's not surprising because they're getting the exact same training that we got a generation ago, um, not incorporating all of these new amazing uh, sets of knowledge. Uh, but further, it's become much more of a job and much less of a profession people graduating today because it's just overwhelming. Doctors today are just completely overwhelmed and it's partially because of regulation, largely because of regulation, um, but there isn't an inspirational vision that the medical community has embraced and um, there's a great book called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. What I like to speak to is the creative reconstruction of health and wellness by restoring some of these ancient wisdoms. And so the new physician is going to lead with empathy, which is the foundation of simplicity. It's going to, this person is going to be a coordinator of a care delivery team. They're going to put the person first. The patient is ready for you now, doctor, instead of the doctor's ready for you now. Um, they will elaborate and validate each individual's values and goals. And I skipped a couple slides where I built that issue where I, I believe that we can use technology to rapidly elucidate and validate an individual's goals and make sure that we offer options that the individual can then match against their own values and objectives in a way that allows them to choose the option that makes sense for them. And the example I use, and this is crazy, but I've used this for years, is uh, option A is that this gives you the maximum benefit, but you've really got to work hard and there's a lot of side effects, potentially. Option B is sort of middle of the road. Option C is you get 80% of the benefit and you don't have to do anything hard and there's almost no side effects. And so the 40-year-old woman whose daughter's getting married in three months says, I'll take option C, and I'll see you three weeks after the wedding when all the families left town, and I want option one after I get through my daughter's wedding. <laughs> and so you can imagine that being able to cast options in terms of human values, not scientific data, well, supported by scientific data, is going to enable that kind of conversation. Support the goals and choices through personalized motivational tools, and then compassionately use the face-to-face -face opportunities, the 0.05% of the time we spend in our lives in the clinic or hospital, hopefully less and less, um, to reinforce um, healthy living outside the hospital. Last slide. Um, and this is hanging on a big bronze plaque in Health and Human Services um, in Washington, D.C., and, and it really moves me uh, truly every time I read it. It's been, uh, this is Hubert Humphrey. It's been said that the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. And given what the second machine age is um, uh, predicting in terms of unemployment and the uh, book Reset about the disappearance of middle class and the rise of social disparities, um, I think it's incumbent upon all of us as leaders in technology as we develop new technologies to pay very careful attention to how are we going to um, build an ecosystem that carries the benefit over from the wealthy in Silicon Valley uh, to the not so wealthy across the railroad tracks in Silicon Valley, as George Packer writes, writes about, or into the uh, less well-served communities of the world. Um, and I'm going to stop there and uh, take a few questions. Thank you very much. organization to these types of directions and movements. I, it just, it's perplexing to me. I, I couldn't imagine how you could do that. I, I've been anxiously awaiting for and dreading that question for a long time. Um, and I usually only answer it in, in private. Um, but it just outed me. Okay, so 
the truth of the matter is that the larger bureaucracy is moving very slowly. And I once asked a question like that um, uh, to Vinod Kozla, the founder's son and head of Kozla Ventures and uh, billionaire. And he said that large institutions are never revolutionized from within. Um, they're challenged by startups uh, and forced to change or die, or they acquire a startup that has a passion and a vision. And so, um, and I was asking about the harm and how are we going to reform the pharmaceuticals? And that was his answer, and I, I've really taken that to heart. But personalizing it to me, um, the reason that I like to take questions, I, I much more enjoy the Q&A than listening to myself talk. The reason I like these questions is so that I can learn more about what all of you are doing um, that contributes towards uh, what I see as an inexorable future. Um, but I do that outside of my work at Kaiser. So I do my day job. I'm, I'm on call 24-7 for managing systems, um, 170,000 employees and thousands of systems. Um, but um, I've also cultivated a team of folks who are so extraordinarily talented um, that they know when to call me, and so I have the luxury of being able to um, speak to groups like this, and I mentor hundreds of startups for free, have no equity in any startup anywhere. Um, my role in the XPRIZE is totally pro bono. And actually, uh, Lee Stein, some of you may know this, Aaron Domar, brilliant entrepreneur, has patented a new business model for how to uh, stimulate uh, entrepreneurs um, in prize categories that we are um, close to uh, launching. Um, so those are the things that get my juices going. Um, I, I do have a couple dozen projects that, I, that I'm sponsoring within Kaiser that does a lot of this stuff, but it moves so slowly that um, I try and do a lot of Thank this. You. Sure. John, um, I was interested to see the word autism yeah. on your slides. And do you have SNPs with that? Are you, are you in the registry at Kaiser? Because there's a national registry for autism. Autism now. Well, I've, I've never admitted to autism before. Um, I've never admitted to having autism before. I'm not you, but all your friends. <laughs> so I, 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 I understand your question. So Eric Shank is um, a very renowned autistic, autism researcher here at UCSD. Um, and I was at a fundraiser he was giving on La Jolla Shores about two years ago. And um, as he was talking, uh, there are over 600 SNPs associated with autism, over 600. They all map to four different neurogenic processes in the, in the genesis of the connectome and the failure of the pruning. Um, so um, every baby goes through a stage of getting about 4 billion neurons, and then they're trimmed down to about 2 billion um, as the scaffolding is pruned away. And the fundamental uh, connectome defect in autism is the failure to prune away the scaffolding that helps to construct the brain. If you look at the connectome online of uh, Temple Grandin, which is online, it's, it's magnificent and beautiful, but it's like a totally complicated mess compared to a normal connectome. So what happens is, is all the scaffolding remains intact. So uh, forgive me for this lengthy answer, but I actually have a hypothesis for what may be causing autism. It's multifactorial for sure. Uh, there's both nature and nurture. And, and coincidence of sibs, um, siblings is high, and the coincidence of Silicon Valley side, allegedly because of the convergence of intelligent parents. Um, but I talked earlier about meiosis and how it generates diversity. There's a lot of experimentation that's very deliberate in uh, sexual species. There's another form of experimentation, and that is what's called metabolic fatigue. And when, when each chromosome is being transcribed, if you get to the end of the chromosome, you run out of an A or a T or C, and you, just, you get sloppy. You start throwing in the wrong base pairs. It's, it's a fact. And so you start thinking about, well, gee, that's kind of dangerous to be experimenting with transcribing, especially towards the end of the chromosome when you get to metabolic fatigue. But it turns out that that's where all your sense of smell um, is located. And a lot of your antibodies um, are located. And so it's, it's just coincidental that places where we need a lot of innovation experimentation are at the end of transcription where metabolic fatigue generates a lot of permutations. So my hypothesis is in the uh, Autism Foundation, which is headed up by the wife of one of my former uh, business partners um, here in Fallbrook, uh, has over 10,000 full genome sequence of autistic kids. And my belief is we could, if we get the full pedigree of those families, 
and subject them to high performance computing and look at some of these other factors. I mean, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it's probably about a $100 million project. And there's some large companies starting with a G that are interested in doing this. Um, and look for an experimental sandbox around brain diversity, generating brain diversity. The human brain has been probably the most phenomenal uh, organ in all of animal speciation and evolution in terms of the human rate of uh, specialization and evolution. The, the, the pace of change of the brain compared to any other organ is phenomenal. So to answer your question, uh, the, the 600 SNPs map to four neurogenic processes. There's something called a Hox gene or homeobox gene, which determines whether a limb bud becomes an arm, a leg, a tail, a wing. Um, it's my belief that, and Eric Crochet independently came to the same conclusion as, and is studying this right now, um, that there is a Hox-like gene for neurogenesis that is subject to deliberate experimentation that, as a downside risk, results in the whole autism spectrum. Um, and so I think that's a testable hypothesis. I don't know if it's going to prove to be true or not, but that's my, my thinking about what might be happening with autism. Will that explain the ep epidemic of autism among young boys? There, there are, that's why it's multifactorial. I, I believe there are, I believe there are other, I believe there are other environmental, like everything in nature nurture. I, I think that the underlying genetic process is some, somehow related to deliberate experimentation of genome. I think there are other factors like antibiotics and disruption of the microbiome and the effect on the immunome and the connectome that may well be related, and that's why it's going to be really, really complicated to unravel. But um, I'm not an autism expert. I'm just hypothesizing based upon the whole panel. Yeah, in the back. Hello. Yeah, I clearly enjoy every minute of your talk. There's just no question you're a visionary about which way healthcare is going. I'm a simple person. I'm a human carpenter. I am an orthopedic surgeon. I fix bones for a living. And uh, what I want to ask from you is more of a philosophical question. How do we redefine the practice of medicine? And I say this because when I started medicine in the late 80s in India, I was examining a patient for about 40 minutes, 37 minutes of which were spent actually holding the patient's hand, examining the patient, talking to the patient. And maybe three minutes was spent on writing my notes. When I practiced medicine in England in 2000, about 50% of my time was spent in examining the patient, and the next 50% in maybe writing the notes. And obviously, I moved across the pond, across the Atlantic, and came here in 2002. My practice of medicine in the Ivy League School of the University of Pennsylvania in 2007, 27 minutes in writing things on the computer, less than three minutes touching the patient or examining the patient. And obviously thanks to a lot of people sitting in this room who added to the technology that doctors use today. Practice of medicine has changed. Uh, I don't know how many of you go for a regular visit to the doctor, but thanks to technology, you have to spend 95% of the time on the computer typing 22 pages of patient information that most of you guys in this room have to analyze for data. <laughs> so what I ask you is, what is your vision about the practice of medicine? Is it going to be in 2020 that we walk through some sort of a frame of technology with no physical exam and an area of tests that is just going to define what the individual is supposed to be treated for, or you believe that the revolution has now come in medicine where there's no more need to go through training for 15 years to become a doctor. Sorry for the long question. Um, that was a beautiful question. Thank you. That was awesome. um, that's why I put up with having to listen to myself drone on is, is to get questions like this. And, um, that's exactly the main question that we need to figure out. Um, I, ha I do have some thoughts about it. I skipped the slide where I talked about that, and I went back to it now. So I think what's going to happen in the future, so forget the slide, I shouldn't have made the correct point. Wait, what is it, control B? What is it, how do you hear people like this? Anyhow. Um, um, ignore the slide for a second. But what I see is happening, to your point, is that this universe of knowledge um, 
from big data is way vaster than a human physician, any human brain can comprehend. The amount of data, little data, about the individual that comes before us, including 3.2 billion base pairs, 95% of which we were told in high school was junk, DNA, inner DNA. We know it now all has a function. Some of, a lot of it is sandboxed, experiment. Um, we don't know how much of what, we're just beginning to unravel that. So we got this huge uh, exponential growth of knowledge in the big data, this huge exponential, exponential growth in the little data, and we're gonna be able to start doing the mashups. But we also need to pay attention to the social determinants of health. And so what I, oh, well, sorry, what I view as the solution is take that out of the purview of the physician. Let the, let the human do what humans do well, let the machines do what machines do well. So machines do far better at the mashup of the universe of knowledge if, about health and wellness and disease and the universe we know about this individual and let that mashup occur. And then let it surface therapeutic options, whether they're pharmaceutical, whether they're exercise or diet based or potentially different surgical options or any set of options. And then be able to array it using visualization tools to that individual patient. So you're, you, you don't have to gather all this data the universe of knowledge, the universe of information about that individual creates a mashup and a set of options that the machines do way better than the human brain. And the human role is to support three conversations, okay? The, the, between the patient and their professional care team, not just the doctor, between the patient with their personal care team, the people they rely on socially to support them in their health and wellness and disease, and between with that individual patient that comes to the exam. How many of you have had an elderly relative go to the doctor and they come home and you say, what did the doctor say? I don't know, I was so nervous. I don't remember what the doctor said, right? So they were the patient in the exam room. We have a project called Open Notes where we're releasing the patient's progress note simultaneously to their health record and every care provider that needs it, as well as to the patient, so that we're, we're reaching a point where we're creating complete transparency between what we have in our record and what the patient has. So they can go home and be the whole person and look at it and have visualization tools that represent the various options to support each of these three conversations. It's my belief that we can use the same visualization tools for each of these three conversations. It's my belief that when we're talking to a PhD who runs three companies, um, that we can drill down to the data that supports each one of those options and then we can match it, we can use other tools, and I'm actually doing pilots in Kaiser right now, to do psychometric profiling of individuals and their values. So we can say, what, what is your value set, and what motivates you, and when we communicate with you, do you prefer humor? Do you prefer a very directed, this is the right option for you? Do you prefer, here's your options, you decide? Or here's your options, let's decide together? Or here's your options, you go talk about your family, and then we'll talk about it with the video conference together afterwards. But I believe that the revolution is going to be letting the machine do almost everything that the docs do today. So both Vinod Kosla and um, Andy Groves, the CEO of Intel, I've spoken to both of them about this, believe that 80% of what doctors currently do is going to go away. I think it's actually going to be more than 80% of what doctors currently do is going to go away because the machine is much better than the human at doing the analytics and let the human return to what healers and curanderos and uh, various forms of healers around the world have always done, is to listen and understand and empathize and be able to represent options in a way that's accessible to the individual about the values that you validated with them that they subscribe to and the objectives that they have. Do they have a daughter getting married in three months? and they want the easy option now and they want the tough option later. But it is the ability to have an evidence-based visualization that's simple enough. And one of the things, I'm, thinking, I'm working with Larry Smarr's visualization team. He, one of the things he did along his career was uh, assemble a team that were the co-inventors of virtual reality. Um, and I'm talking to them about how we might be able to create these visualizations in ways that are very sort of archetypal and accessible, but yet drill down to every level of detail about the universe of knowledge from big data and the universe of knowledge about that individual. So depending upon the capacity and the curiosity and the interest of the individual to drill down 
to have that discussion and to support it with science, but to but to in, to to really embed it and embrace it within empathy and values and compassion and listening and understanding, and that 27 minutes of documentation will go away with more modern methods of acquiring and recording the information. And so we have micro projects working on every one of those little things. But again, it's going to be a while for that to happen. We're in this very, very, very unstable transition state between the old world of anatomic-based disease models to big data evidence-based, little data evidence-based, visualization tools, values-based, empathy-based healthcare. So it is actually what I could describe as using modern technology to restore ancient wisdoms of caring. And William Osler's quote of the secret to patient care is caring for the patient. And I think that's where we will get to. Again, I'm frequently disappointed in how far off my clear view is from a short distance. <laughs> Last two questions. Sure. Yes, I have a very simple question. So we have been all sort of listening about the thousand dollar genome. So are there service providers currently which kind of provide genome? I'm, I'm not talking 23 and me, you know, the whole genome sequencing who provide the service for fee. And secondly, if I have my genome sequence, are there currently available softwares which say a lay person can look at it and okay, there are the SNPs and these are the differences and these are you know, so sort of a general question. So the, the UK just committed um, I think half a billion dollars to sequence 500,000, fully sequence 500,000 people. Um, company that starts with a G is spending a ton of money in the space. Um, there are other large companies um, that recognize that this is the future and they're starting to invest in it at a thousand bucks a pop. That's a lot of money when you multiply it by you know, hundreds of millions of people or billions of people. So there's a lot of banking going tissue banking. And so at Kaiser Permanente, we have a couple of tissue banking. We ask people their consent, they say yes, we store their stuff. And when it gets down to a couple hundred bucks, we can just start doing it. Um, and when the evidence is sufficient to justify the cost, you know, what we can do about that uh, justifies the cost. Today, you don't get, on average, $1,000 worth of information out of your complete genome. You know, for a researcher, you sure tech do, but for a patient, you don't get $1,000 yet. But as the actionable knowledge that we acquire about what it means and who should be screened regularly with a mammogram and a pap smear and a colonoscopy and who should never bother. Um, and this goes for all diseases. I mean, we know that there are genes for Parkinson's disease. We know that people who suffer from chronic migraines with auras have twice the incidence of Parkinson's disease. But we also know that there's a gene uh, discovered by 23andMe that almost annihilates the risk of the, ge the genetic markers of Parkinson's disease. So as we start accumulating, we now have three times the SNPs that we had three months ago for schizophrenia. As this exponential growth of knowledge occurs, the value of sequencing the genome goes up, and the super Moore's law decline goes down, and the intersection point, I'm pretty certain it's going to be within two to three years. So that it will be malpractice um, to um, have a patient who wants their genome sequenced, who has a poorly characterized disease um, and not allow them to have a $150, $200. I mean, 23andMe, for those who haven't done it, it just does the exome, which is just 30,000 beads per coder proteins, a couple of million base pairs. You can get it for 80 bucks. Um, so it's already 80 bucks to get the genes and coder proteins. But it's going to be 80 bucks for the full genome very soon, and the value is thousands of dollars about the same time. So the intersection point is going to drive it. We're, we're not there today. It's not worth $1,000 per person as a patient today. But that, that, that crossover point is coming very soon. Last question. Last question. Hey, Dr. Matheson, I um, loved your presentation, like your slides, very articulate, amazing, inspiring. But I would love to know where you, I mean, you're very widely read, obviously. Where you um, go for diversity of thought and information, what are the 
periodicals, sources? What do you like to expose yourself to to keep it white and fresh? Wow. Um, <laughs> a lot of crowdsourcing. Um, my best source is giving talks and getting these questions. Um, seriously, that's my best source. And it's the, it's the people who come up to me afterwards and say, I'm doing the startup. I'm in stealth mode. Here's what I'm thinking about. Are you interested in joining our board? And the answer is no, I can't because I have a conflict of interest policy, but I will advise you for free. You can live with that. And there's people in this room who have heard me say that. If you can live with me giving you advice for free, I will give you advice for free. So I have a window into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of really smart startups because I advise for free. That's my primary source. And I, I do that by giving talks and having people come up and have private conversations about what they're doing in stealth. Um, and um, you know, and, and there's the usual suspects, TechCrunch, um, and there's a lot of listservs, um, and TED, and TEDMed, and TEDx, and um, I have a lot of friends who are deep in the TED community, and they just keep sending me stuff. So it's, it's a lot of social networking. It's a lot of social networking. People just send me stuff because they know it might be interesting, and I send it right back. So cultivate your network of people who like to share good ideas, not because they want to uh, profit by it faster than you, but because they think that, that by sharing more, um, the net worth of the community goes up. And so surround yourself with those kind of people. I think that's the best form of getting a stream of fresh ideas. And that's what I get to these talks. So thank you all very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Minus. This was a very well-received talk. It had the breadth and depth. And thank you very much to acknowledge uh, you coming here. This is a small token. Thank you very much. Please come back soon again. Uh, my pleasure.